This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Last week in Science Magazine, there was an article on the Energy Frontier Research Centers, and there was something that, frankly, we never thought about. Namely, what it has done is to bring together faculty who were competitors, who would try to outdo one another, into a collegial relationship where they're partners. And so you will see here and elsewhere groups of faculty coming together, we call it self-organizing, around topics that they care about, that they want to do something about that will change the energy landscape of this nation and world. That has proven to be a remarkable asset, I believe, to our country. And I just want you all to understand how special this institute is, how sp the fact that it was so recognized in this completely open, peer-reviewed competition. Uh, it's a real testament uh, to the institute itself. And of course, it's a great delight to have been invited before the award uh, to address uh, this august body. The first slide has a subtitle on it, which is one of the workshops we put together. This workshop met in November of last year. And you can find the uh, report from that workshop on the website. And I've given you uh, the web address. In order, this will be a fairly detailed presentation, in order not to have to make you write, I've also handed out copies of the presentation. And if you don't have one, there's lots of extras around. And it will also be, I understand, on the website uh, for this conference within about a week. The thing that I'll be talking about this afternoon are those seventh graders. That is, I'll be talking about not what's around the corner tomorrow, but what new technologies, we, I will introduce the concept of control science, what opportunities are there which I believe will be transformational, which will change the way we do business in energy. Now, some of them will work, some of them may not. And it's such a broad area that I'm only going to cover three topics as I go through. But those seventh graders 10 years from now will be graduates of this institution. And hopefully, between now and then, you will have invested in many of these areas and created new opportunities, new excitement, uh, and choices for these students to fulfill the need that our country and world has, as you heard from the previous panel. Now, what are the challenges? for the United States. This is how it looked a couple of years ago to the Department of Energy. Each of these titles is actually the subject of a workshop which we ran in 2006. We brought people from all over the world to deal with energy security, environmental sustainability, and economic opportunity. The challenges that the United States faced are huge. The problem was so immense in our view that even incremental challenges to very exciting technologies were not, in our view, capable of dealing with the magnitude of the challenges facing the country. And so the purpose of these workshops, which culminated in the one last November, was to lay out a roadmap for transformational research research whose results would change the game when dealing with energy issues. So that was the focus, and I think we are now at a point where we can look at the future, 
for this century, rather than continuing what Faraday did in the 19th century, which as far as I'm concerned is about where we find batteries today, or the results of the 20th century. It is a new opportunity, I believe, for intellectual excitement, discovery, and for dealing with the issues that we face in an energy-constrained world. The workshop last November invented a title which they called Controlled Science. And what this had to do with is the wonderful ability that we have literally created within the last decade to control matter and energy at the electronic, atomic, and molecular levels. We can now place atoms where we wish, we can observe them in real space, and we can get them to initiate the flow of energy and control chemical and physical phenomena. This is new, and we do not know the boundaries of this new science, but it is now possible to deal with the energy challenges using that science. So we are literally creating materials one atom at a time and having them perform in the ways that we want the material to exhibit. Let me give you some examples. Our nuclear reactor vessels are terribly important, but they crack. At a workshop, we asked the industry, if we could do something transformational for you, what would it be? And they said, predict a crack. And then if you really are good, fix it without our having to take the machine apart and rebuild of the containment um, vessel. We are now working with materials that self-heal. That is, materials that can repair the consequences of an atomic displacement. In nuclear reactors today, over, say, a 40-year period, most of the nuclei have been displaced hundreds of times by the neutron fluence that occurs in their presence. Things happen. And is it possible to design materials that will heal themselves? If it is, if we can control surface properties so that the flaking that occurs with uh, fuel elements, uh, the uh, scaling that one has to work with, going from that surface to hydrodynamic lengths associated with the coolant. If we were able to predict these, we could, our belief is, increase the temperature and efficiency of current nuclear power plants, fission products. Coal-fired power plants could be increased uh, to something like 60% efficiency, more, more or less a doubling. Cars could be made from very lightweight materials with 100 times the strength of steel, but only one-sixth the weight. And I don't have to tell you the conservation of energy that that would entail. Now I'm going to talk about three examples of where this new control science can make a transformational difference. The first is making fuels from sunlight. You heard a lot this morning and yesterday about photovoltaics, but I'm not talking about electricity, I'm talking about fuel. I will talk about electrical energy storage, which um, you've heard was the missing link uh, when the discussion yesterday focused on the grids and the intermittent, intermittent sources of electrical energy from wind and solar. And then I would like to talk about closing the nuclear fuel cycle. Though fission is not formally a part of this meeting, in fact, it provides about 20% of our electricity in the United States. And there are many of us, including me, who believe that a nuclear future is critical if we're ever going to tackle the issue of carbon. And so the leitmotif going through all of these presentations will be carbon. How can we produce energy without producing CO2? Is there an environmentally benign way 
of getting out of the box in which we currently find ourselves. I, was ref I referred to fuels from sunlight. And of course, if you look around the room or at any plant, you've got an example of how photosynthesis creates fuel. ADP, in this case, food for the plant. But why can't we do better than plants? Plants are actually only about 1% efficient when it comes to the energy that they absorb and the fuel that they produce. Is there any way that we could use water and CO2 as nutrients in an artificial photosynthetic structure? We could capture photons uh, in water and split water into its constituent parts using hydrogen as a fuel. We could make clean fuels in chemical reactors if we somehow knew how to do what nature does literally every day. The structures that nature works with are very complex, and I haven't shown you the full Calvin cycle, but this, one of the steps in that cycle is this very complex um, structure called photosystem one. And here is a first step example of how you might deal with artificial photosynthesis, but in this case, using what nature provides, photosystem one, as your initial step. What happens in photosynthesis is that a photon is absorbed and a reducing electron is produced. That electron goes to a redox or reaction center, and it doesn't have enough energy from the photon in the sun to produce energy, to produce ADP. So a second photon is captured, a second electron goes to the redox center, and the two of them combine to give you enough energy to do chemistry. You can think of it as a two-photon absorption, but it's really in two steps. Well, here's an example of that collector, and it produces a reducing electron. What you can do is create an artificial bridge to a gold, or in this case, platinum nanoparticle, which can then split water and produce hydrogen. And actually, it's turned, the reference is given here, it's turned out to be quite a, uh, uh, an impressive production. In this case, a single molecule uh, can generate eight <coughs> uh, molecules of hydrogen um, per second over a fairly extensive time scale. And up to that time, the production uh, were much, much less. So you have a situation here of what I would call a hybrid, namely dealing with a natural material, in this case photosystem one, and then a nanoparticle connected to it in such a way that you can, if you like, do chemistry, produce fuel. Now, the trouble with this system is you have to have a photosystem one, and that protein is very complicated, as you can see from this picture. There actually are two photosystems uh, in uh, most plants, photosystem one and photosystem two. The next slide shows you uh, what Nate Lewis at Caltech has been working on, which is to do this artificially. We don't need the photosystem one. What he did was to take a nano rod, a, a rod made out of nanoparticles, which absorbed the light, and then the trick is to separate the reducing electron from the photon absorption center so you can do chemistry with it. But the problem is that you would then have to have a length scale, enough room for that reducing electron to move in the same material in which you've absorbed the photon. And that's very difficult, as any of you who work in photo cells know. What he did was to use geometry to simplify it. Namely, in the vertical direction, he absorbed the photon, producing the reducing electron, but then had it move in the transverse direction. And since these were very thin nano rods, they could escape and do chemistry. Now, it's just uh, the beginning 
of a production of, in this case, oxygen and hydrogen, but it is, in fact, an artificial photosynthesis um, structure. Can we do better? Of course. But this is the direction that I'm suggesting, namely doing photosynthesis, absorbing CO2 the way nature does, and producing fuel. The next issue that I would like to talk about is electrical energy storage. And this is indeed the missing link for um, intermittent energy sources. Richard Swanson was the one who said yesterday that storage is the great missing link. And if you are in the utility business and you have wind power and solar power of significant magnitude, you usually have to have backup with a peak load generator to make up for the time when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine. This has a high capital cost, um, and it is something that we really ought to be able to solve. The difficulty is that, so far, the only way we know how to store large quantities of electricity is by pumping water up a hill. The Romans did that very efficiently. We're not much better off two millennia later. Now, you can use compressed gas, you can use large flywheels, but none of these are going to be available for a household situation, which you heard about yesterday, when you have a distributed solar system. So what we're talking about is, is there a way in which to store electricity much better than our current batteries, about which, by the way, you heard this morning. There are a number of technical uh, approaches which are being explored, and I would like to um, discuss just a few of them right now. In the first place, we need to understand how electrical energy is used. Batteries can uh, take a great deal of energy density, but the power density, that is their ability to deliver that electrical energy quickly, is limited. And over the last couple of years, supercapacitors have become possible, again because of nanotechnology, which have increased the capability of electrical storage by at least six, if not eight, orders of magnitude. We were discussing at lunch, those of us who used to build radios back uh, when I was uh, a little older than a seventh grader, but we had these huge electrolytic capacitors, and they were big cans, and they had about 10 microfarads, which was a lot of capacity at that time. Well, supercapacitors now are measured in units of 10 farads, or 100 farads, in the same volume. And so our ability to store electricity in capacitors has increased hugely as a consequence of going to the nanoscale. My guess is that the vehicles and use of electricity where you want sudden surges will be some combination of supercapacitors and batteries. The supercapacitors for the very fast delivery of electrical energy, the batteries for the long-term storage. This combination may in fact end up being in the same material, but right now they're two separate um, issues. What's the difficulty? The problem is that the supercapacitors depend on very small distances between the electrodes. And over time, there's a possibility that the electrolyte material will decay. You'll get a short. Can you come up with electrolyte materials that cure themselves? that fix defects? We believe the answer is yes, and we're just in the process of trying to engineer materials that will do just that. What are some of the materials that we're looking at? Um, this is an example of opportunities that we now have that we hadn't had before. You heard a lot this morning already of the lithium iron phosphate uh, electrode. Dr. Uh, Tarascon uh, from France uh, described uh, his own research at making this environmentally benign. 
Um, he also showed the same equation that I have up here, namely, our current use of batteries is one electron transfer, the lithium ion. Why not two electron transfer, cobalt? Why not four electron transfer, vanadium, and so on? Is it possible to come up with a multi-electron structure for electrical energy storage and batteries that would increase the capacity by literally factors of two or four? And you'll remember from his slide, if we could get to a factor of four, we've done a huge amount when it comes to electric vehicles. The nanoscale architectures for ultracapacitors. And finally, understanding what happens in constrained space with materials and being able to design them so that they fix themselves and still exhibit the properties that you wish. This, to me, is indeed one of the major challenges that will transform our energy future. It will enable the grid to stabilize in the presence of changes in wind or solar or other intermittent sources, but it's a job that will depend on 21st century technology. The last topic I want to discuss is nuclear power. Why is there so much, <laughs> I would say opposition, but it's not even opposition, it's, it's just unstated reference to nuclear power. If you listen to people talk about energy sources, somehow fission energy uh, is either ignored or even worse, denigrated. And yet, as we know, 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear, and we could probably increase that to 30%. We've done that in the past. We can build more nuclear reactors. There is every indication that they are as safe uh, as required. What's the problem? The problem is spent fuel. All throughout this talk, I've been talking about the environment. Now, the spent fuel from a nuclear reactor is nasty stuff. But the stupidest thing you could do is put it in the ground at Yucca Mountain. Not because there's anything wrong with Yucca Mountain, which there may be, but because it's full of energy. It has 1% uranium-235. The natural abundance is 0.7%. That may not sound like much, but that's a huge amount of enrichment. It also has plutonium. The French have been separating that for 20 years, oxidizing it and using it as a nuclear fuel. It also has neptunium. It also has curium. All of those are fissionable. Putting them in the ground is nuts. Instead, putting them into a new nuclear fuel that you could then use in a light water reactor or a fast spectrum reactor if you want to move in that direction, all of those make economic sense. We do not know how to efficiently separate all those materials I just described and produce new fuels. Those new fuels have not yet been licensed. But why not engage our electrochemists in a project to do just that? The difficulty is for 30 years, we have not been reprocessing or recycling spent fuel. This is actually a policy position that was taken by the Carter administration. To my knowledge, it's not stopped anyone from proliferation. Just ask the Pakistanis or the Indians or the North Koreans. All it did was ruin our nuclear future. In my view, we need to reinvent that. Now, there's some other nasties in spent fuel. There is strontium and iodine, which have very high heat loads and high toxic toxicity, but they also have short half-lives, 30 years. So you separate them out, you cover them with concrete, and 100 years from now, there's nothing to worry about. There is still a little bit left over, the americium, which has a long half-life. But its toxicity is 1 100th of what you started with. And you can put that in a salt mine. It's called WIP uh, in uh, New Mexico. And the salt will form around it, and that's it. So there is a solution to the nuclear future which avoids the issue of uh, the environmental insult. And it's my view that this nation needs to invest in a nuclear future as part 
of the carbon-constrained environment. We had three workshops, one on materials that I've already described that can self-heal. We had one on nuclear physics. Believe it or not, we do not even know the nuclear cross-sections that occur in a nuclear reactor during the fission cycle. And finally, using our really quite remarkable new high-end computers, actually simulating the entire fuel cycle, in turning, including fission, so that we can more efficiently design our nuclear reactors. Right now, the codes are all phenomenological. As a consequence, we overbuild. They're more expensive, and we can't predict the actual lifetime or failure modes. We should be able to do that. So we can recycle spent fuel, burn it in fission reaction, uh, fish, fission reactors. I haven't mentioned the fast spectrum rea reactor except by title, but ultimately we can produce our own fissionable material uh, from what are called breeder reactors. There is a nuclear future, and I would not like to see the spent fuel issue keep us from addressing that future. Let me conclude, therefore, by talking about our future, about those seventh graders. My belief is that energy systems of the future will revolve around materials and chemical changes that convert energy from one form to another. They will be smarter and more functional than what we have today. I believe we have the opportunity for a whole new approach to materials, namely control science, where we work literally at the atomic level, building what it is that we want to create. And finally, my belief is that we can control energy conversion via these opportunities and give our country true environmentally benign energy security. Thank you.